Good evening, everyone. How are you? My name is Wes Hazard, and you are with a virtual Stories from the Stage event. So nice to have you. Welcome again for those who are joining us uh, and have been here before. For those of you just tuning in, you're in for a special treat tonight. We have an amazing evening of very talented storytellers who will be speaking on what giving means to them. So again, this is Stories from the Stage, and we have a special story slam. So you're going to hear six tellers uh, chosen at random order. I'm going to be picking names out of this vessel. We'll call it a glass bowl or a hat. It's actually a picture, but you don't have to worry about that. And they're all going to be speaking on this Giving Tuesday about what the theme of giving means to them. So while they are going to uh, get started and preparing, I'm going to give them an opportunity to get their uh, heads together. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the amazing event that we have and the program that we have. Uh, WGBH, and uh, Stories from the Stage, or I should say GBH. So Stories from the Stage is a co-production of World Channel and GBH events, along with Massachusetts-based storytelling organization, Tell and Act. Tonight, we have some fantastic tellers, but as you know, in addition to these live virtual events, we also have a regular nationally televised program, which you can catch on GBH2 Fridays at 8 p.m. and on Mondays at 9.30 p.m. Eastern time, on World Channel. You can also view all episodes online, so please do that. We are coming back for an amazing fifth season. I uh, feel very fortunate, both me and my co-host, Teresa Kokan have really enjoyed bringing stories to the stage uh, to you all of these past few years, and thank you so much for being with us as we're doing it. So uh, we're gonna go ahead and get into things in a little bit. Uh, I just wanna let you know that we are going to have closed captioning available. Zoom has recently rolled out an automated scrap captioning feature, and we are excited to now be able to offer this to you so that everyone can enjoy that functionality if you so choose. So if you would like to get the closed caption live, please go click on the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen. Two uh, transcript display options will pop up. We recommend that you select the subtitle to enable captioning at the bottom of your screen. You can also select full transcript and a sidebar window will open where you can see what each speaker is saying. Please bear in mind that the captioning might be slightly delayed. It is doing a live voice capture by a computer. So if you've ever used Google Translate or tried to dictate to Siri or Alexa, you know how that can go a little bit off sometimes, but generally it has been very good and we have found the quality to be amazing. So I'll be bringing up some storytellers. Uh, at the end, as this is a story slam, you are going to have the opportunity to vote for your favorite teller and the winner will be walking away with a $125 cash prize. So uh, please do uh, pay attention for the duration of the event. That won't be hard. The storytellers are absolutely amazing. And uh, you might want to go ahead and just jot down uh, each individual's name. Uh, I'll be saying that before and after they uh, come to the stage so that you can uh, be ready to vote when the time comes. Again, you'll have the opportunity to do that at the end of the show. So without uh, further ado, I'm going to go ahead and pick our first teller from the picture. Get excited. And uh, of course, uh, your storytellers won't be able to really uh, see or hear you, but we do like spiritual applause. So uh, as, you're, as you're watching this at your home, at your desk, wherever you happen to be, uh, as I'm bringing up tellers, please go ahead and clap uh, just as if it were an actual show. We, we really would love that. It is an actual show, but an, an in-person one, I should say. So our first teller we have is... We have Margo Lightman. Margo Lightman, so fantastic teller. Very excited to bring Margo to the stage. She is the author of the best-selling book, Long Story Short and Gawky, Tales of an, uh, of an ex Extra Long Awkward Face. She's written for DreamWorks TV and the Hallmark Channel and the Pixel Network. And she has worked for This American Life, a fantastic NPR show, as the West Coast Storytelling Scout. She also founded the storytelling program at the Upright Citizens, Citizens Brigade Theater. So please join me in welcoming Margot Lightman. Thank you so much, Wes. So these past few years have really made us question karma, the act of what goes around comes around. I remember once walking through the commons when I was in college and the little boy was walking with a balloon and his mom was standing next to him when some jerky towny kid walked through holding, smoking a cigarette and popped the kid's balloon with the lit cigarette. And the kid obviously started crying. 
And the mother just looked at the kid and said, don't worry, baby, he'll get his. And I've thought about that moment a lot in the past few years. And I've really waited for some sort of karma to get a lot of people, people that aren't making good choices, people spreading lies right now, people, people making the world a worse place. But in the words of my uh, French Duolingo app, Delorean, I haven't seen much karma, nothing. So about a year ago, I got really into hiking with my kids. It was during that time that Biden had just won the election, but he wasn't in office yet. And everything felt just a little uneasy and scary because scary things were about to happen. And hiking was a big pandemic phase for me after jigsaw puzzles right before experimenting with heavy drinking, which was a fun time. <laughs> we found this hike deep in Altadena where you could reach a waterfall. And it was magical to be spending this day, you know, a Wednesday morning exploring nature with my kids when normally I would be working and they would be at school. And it was one of those rare days when I was homeschooling them that I wasn't questioning, okay, is this what I'm gonna be doing for the rest of my life? Is this just who I am now? <clears throat> we got back to the car, all sweaty and invigorated. And my kids were suddenly starving. And I decided to bend the rules and stop at the closest restaurant, which was McDonald's, and run in and grab them Happy Meals while I left them in the car unattended, <laughs> which I know was basically I was feeding them gasoline back basically after, at, after all of the hiking work that we had done, which really counteracted the physical fitness we had just done. But you know what? It had been a year. They can have some Happy Meals. Let it go. And I went in to pay, and I couldn't find any of my credit cards or the $20 cash I had in my wallet. And I figured maybe when walking in, I had held my wallet upside down and the car, the cards had fallen out in the parking lot. Maybe that's all that happened. So I paid with my business credit card, which was at the back of my wallet, because during COVID, if you run a business based on large crowds travel and traveling in front of large groups while getting on a plane, you aren't using your business card that much. So I found it in the back and I used that. When I got back, my credit cards were nowhere to be found in the parking lot. And then I checked the apps for them on my phone and there were some very recent transactions. In fact, $4,000 at Best Buy and $250 at Ulta Makeup, both done simultaneously while I was hiking to a waterfall. Okay, so I'd been robbed. Some jerk broke into my car and which I had left my wallet in while I was hiking because I decided it would be too heavy to carry while hiking. I'm not in the greatest of shape. And then I also realized that there was no sign of intrusion into my car. So on top of that, I must have somehow left the car open with my wallet in while hiking. I didn't mean to leave it unlocked, but did I deserve it? Did I get mine? Oh my gosh, it felt invasive. And look, I know it's not such a big deal to get robbed. I mean, in, in the, get your money stolen in a time where the world was happening. I mean, it's November, 2020. The election had just happened. The pandemic numbers were really high. Was this really the worst thing that happened? I seem to get robbed at times like this. The last time I got my wallet stolen, I was living in Manhattan and it was September 9th, 2011, two, excuse me, September 9th, 2001. A few days later, just two days later, I thought, you know what? I think the police have probably forgotten about your case. Maybe just get a new driver's license and get over it. There are bigger things going on in the world right now than your wallet. So on the ride home, I started frantically calling the banks to cancel everything, getting in arguments about, no, 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 why would I ever spend $250 in one shot at Ulta? I'm not that type of a girl. No, it wasn't me. I told them I was more of a Sephora girl, which is a complete lie. I'm really more of a CVS girl, is more of like a luxury makeup for me. Or if I'm being really realistic with you, I'm more of a buy the makeup at Albertsons, it's the wrong shade for your skin while you're shopping with your two children. I, I don't have time to shop at Ulta and spend $250. And no, I didn't spend $4,000 at Best Buy while simultaneously hiking to a waterfall. And I'm yelling at the bank while driving and my kids are munching on their chicken nuggets. And then I realize I'm gonna be late to get home to teach a class on Zoom. Because when you've started wor start working at 2 p.m. out of your living room, sometimes you forget you aren't actually going to work. You're more kind of rolling over to work and nothing really matters anymore. And then you had good credit before and is this gonna ruin that? And as I was on hold with the bank while emailing my class to tell them I've been robbed and class will be starting a little late, all from the red light, I see a woman in a blue shirt 
just waving frantically to get me to come over. And my kids are like, mom, she wants you to pull over, pull over, pull over. And I'm thinking, oh gosh, this would be just my day. My flat tire, I probably have a flat tire or something. And she's telling me it's not safe for me to drive. But I pull over and I roll down the window and she basically, this woman in the blue shirt basically screams in my face, you've won, congratulations, free gas. Come with me, we'll fill up your tank. Happy Honda days. And I was like, the happy Honda days lady is a real person. And I got so choked up because everything melted away in that moment, the election and COVID and my credit cards and Ulta and Best Buy and my wallet from 2001. I mean, I got free gas. <sighs> and as I pulled up, she filled my tank and there were zero strings attached. And all I could think was back to that little boy in the balloon. Well, 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 don't worry, baby, he'll get his. And that my friend is karma. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Margaret. That was a fantastic story. Uh, it is a pleasure to know that the free Honda days are an actual thing. Uh, I was thrilled as much as anyone to, to get that news. Uh, what a fantastic story. And again, our theme today is giving. We have our fantastic tellers talking about what that means to them on today, Giving Tuesday. So that was a, a wonderful story. Please remember Margot's name. Uh, you will, anyone watching this, have the opportunity to vote for your favorite storyteller at the end of the show. We're gonna do a poll right here in the Zoom. So do keep track of the tellers that particularly speak to you. I know they're all fantastic, but uh, we are going to have a winner walking away with a $125 cash prize at the end of the event. And without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and and, uh, select our next teller from the ye old magical picture of fate. And let's see who we have right here. Uh, yes, fantastic. Right now we have uh, Shanjay Lahiri will be coming up next. Uh, fantastic teller has been with the Stories from the Stage before, uh, originally from Kolkata, India, but has called the Boston area home for over 20 years. Uh, she's had a long career in environmental management and in, is a GIS specialist. And she is also a writer and producer who recently, one of her short stories was recognized as Boston's 2021 One City, One Story selection that is indeed an honor. Uh, she should be very proud. Please join me in bringing up to the Stories from the Stage, virtual stage, Sanjay Lahiri, make some noise. Hello. Um, my video is on. Is, can you see me? Okay, so I'm going to get started then. Our son, whose name is Oyun, was almost three years old when we realized that he had a magic power that was transforming our homes into this wonderland. It was his imagination that turned the cushions on our couch into a fort one day and a spaceship the next, that congested our floors with lines of traffic, with uh, neatly uh, lined up cars and trains that crisscrossed all over the place. And to everything, there was a soundtrack of laughter and giggles and vroom vroom and chugga chugga and just the sound of adventure. And as I just washed and swam in this world of childhood delight, I found myself thinking back more and more to my last visit back home to Kolkata, India. Oyan would have been about a year old, and maybe that's why I was noticing the street children more and more. You know, they were ragged and ruthless, hungry and dirty, but their soundtrack was familiar to me squealing and laughter, but not with toys and trains, balled up newspaper and cans. Something else was familiar too, though, and that was my grief. Because as a child, I had been just racked with sadness at the idea of this injustice that little children would suffer. And I remember my parents not knowing what to do with me and just saying, this problem is too big. You can't fix it. Just don't think about it. And all these years later, when my own son's childhood was playing out in technicolor hues, I couldn't help but think about it. Why? Why can't I do a little something for a little time? And 
why does Oyon have to look forward to a future where one day he's going to feel grief too? Because he was going to encounter poverty and unfairness and he wouldn't have to go to another continent. It would be right here in our backyard in the good old US of A, this much I knew. So my husband and I put our heads together and we hatched a plan. Oyon's third birthday was very, very close. So we found this wonderful organization, the next town over in Newton, called Birthday Wishes. What they did was they, they still do, they threw birthday parties for children in homeless shelters whose parents very often don't even tell them it's their birthday because they're not able to celebrate. And the whole thing works on donated new gifts, so everything was in place. So we put our plan in action about a month before Oyun's birthday when I introduced the idea of homelessness to him carefully. This is a child who cried himself to sleep when I squished a spider and he still yells at me for weeding dandelions because well, I don't think get to live. I told him that it was, I, I made it really simple. I said it was, you know, when someone loses their house in a fire and they don't have money, so they go to a shelter. And then I stood back and I kind of watched to see how he'd do. And my little boy did great. He he held, he was not upset. In fact, in the next few weeks, we had some really good conversations, questions, good ideas, including donating some of his toys, old toys. So that brought us up to about a week before his birthday when it was time to introduce the idea of gifts and presents. Because this was his first real party. And I told him that, look, your actual birthday is in the middle of the week. Baba, his dad, and I are going to give you some really cool toys that are just for you. They're keepers. But your birthday party gifts, those are yours to do whatever you want with. And sure enough, the kid connected the dots just how I hoped he would. And he said, those, Mama, are for the children. And I said, so party day comes. Party day goes. Kids have a riot. Oyun and his dad are sitting in the living room unwrapping the gifts because in Indian culture, we don't open birthday gifts during the party because that makes us seem greedy. And then our guests may be upset if their gift isn't as good as someone else's. So it's after the party. And you would think that this would be a time for celebration because Oyun is saying, oh, these are for the kids in a shelter. But something strange really happened. I found myself paralyzed and frozen with guilt. I was racked with it. I was pacing the hall thinking, Chandra, you idiot, what have you done? How is this a good idea? I mean, first of all, it was the worst cliche in the world that I was trying to delete my childhood grief by living vicariously through my kid. Leave alone that. How do I know it was work? How do I know that instead of becoming generous, you wouldn't become greedy because I had deprived him or something? You'd be on the psychiatrist's couch before long. But even more importantly, what if he developed some sort of savior complex and a sense of superiority? So all these thoughts are tumbling around in my head and I'm just berating myself. When I hear this squeal from the living room that sends me running inside, I thought he'd hurt himself. And the little kid is sitting there holding this humongous box that has a cement mixer in it. This is the truck that is on his Christmas lift. He just loves this thing and the box has one of those plastic windows to which you can see and you can see how gorgeous it is and that was it I was like okay this is it I'm a horrible person it's all off but just before I say it I get struck like by lightning an idea and I say hey kiddo these are cool but can you show us the toys that Baba and I got you he scampers off into his room and comes back with an armful of the gifts we gave him just a few days ago. And we put it on the floor and we ooh and we ah. Uh. And then while he's th still in the throes of delight, I tell him, hey, wait, 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 it's toys that you liked before your birthday. Can I see those? And off like a roadrunner, back in a second with his favorite toys and cars and everything. And now we're looking at those. And this is the time that I stand back and I let him just look at everything. And standing in the middle of his ocean of wealth, I ask him one more time, Oyan, are you sure you want to give away your toys to the shelter? Do you want me to keep the cement truck? And he looks around and he goes, nope, those are for the kids. You think that would be great? Nope, I'm still not sleeping at night racked with guilt. And my husband, who's a voice of reason, says, let's just follow his lead. And I do what most people do when faced with a difficult decision. I put off the decision. It is now a month 
after the party. The presents are sitting in a pile in a corner of the room. And Oyan has developed this very strange tradition of running there right after he gets back from daycare every day, picking up that cement mixer mixture and uh, uh, truck and just looking at it, staring at it for up to an hour. That little glass, that uh, plastic window is smudged with the imprint of his little nose. And then if enough is enough, can they shit or get off the pot? We pile all the toys into my car. We go to the church in Newton and we meet the director of Birthday Wishes, Lisa Vasilov, for the first time. She's wonderful. And the, both of us are watching as Owen pulls out all the toys from the bag and puts it on the table. The last thing to come out is a cement mixer. And I can't help it. I lean in and I say, Owen, are you sure you don't want to keep that? He gives me a curt little no. And that's that. And that was 12 years ago. Owen's 15 now. And on the wall of Lisa's office and birthday wishes is a series of photographs of Oyun every year from then until recently. And I know we haven't solved any problems and I don't know if he's gonna turn out to be greedy or have a savior problem. But what I know is a little bit of something may just be more than a whole lot of nothing. Thank you all. All right, thank you so much for that fantastic story, Chandra. Uh, that's Chandra Lahiri. Please keep her in mind. Uh, and I'm sure everyone loved the story as you will for all tellers tonight, but you again will have the opportunity to vote on your favorite teller at the very end. And we'll be putting a poll right here on Zoom. So please keep that in mind and keep track of the details that you are particularly loving this evening, this Giving Tuesday. Uh, we are going to take a very short moment right now uh, for some messages about how you can contribute and become involved more with GBH Avenge and World Channel. So I'll turn it over to Jamie for some announcements from the team. Thank you, Wes. And uh, thanks so much to our audience at home for joining us tonight. You know, here at GBH, storytelling is at the heart of what we do. We strive to highlight the importance of storytelling, not only as an art form, but also as a method to bring people together. If you value GBH programs like Stories from the Stage, we ask you to please make a donation. If you're able to give $10 a month or $120 per year, you will receive the Stories from the Stage mug and journal set pictured behind me. The stylish 12 ounce ceramic mug is microwave and dishwasher safe. The softbound journal is perfect for taking notes, writing lists and jotting down great story ideas. You know, play a lead role in GBH's continuing story today. Donating is simple and secure. Please go to gbh.org slash support events and click on that link you see in the chat tab and contribute what you can. You may also opt to text GBH to 800 204-3811. I'll say it one more time. Please text GBH to 800-204-3811. You can also scan the QR code behind me to be brought directly to our donation page. Please help us reach our year-end fundraising goals by showing your support today, your support for great stories. That's how we're able to continue bringing wonderful programs like Stories from the Stage to audiences. And now with that message, back to Wes and our fabulous storytellers with more great stories about giving. Excellent. Thank you, everyone, again, for tuning in with us here on Zoom for a special Stories from the Stage virtual event. We are having a story slam right now. You've heard two tellers so far. You're going to hear four more for the, throughout the rest of the evening. And again, you will have the opportunity to vote for your favorite at the end of the show right here in the Zoom. But without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and bring up our next teller. So we're going to go to the magical picture of telling and see who we have right here. Our next teller will be Megan Finnerty. That's Megan Finnerty. Very excited to bring Megan to the stage. Megan is a professional listener who likes to talk, which is her way of uh, referring to herself as a journalist and a storytelling consultant for both individuals, nonprofits, and national brands. She is the director of the Storytellers Brand Studio and is the founder and director of the Storytellers Project, a national series of events which has been covered in national media. Please join us in welcoming Megan Finnerty. Thank you. Hi, 
everyone. I'm so excited to be here. Hi. Um, I'll start my story. The first gift Liz Warren, not the politician, but the anthropologist and educator gave me was the opportunity to meet with her colleague Marilyn at a cafe in downtown Phoenix. At the time, I was working as a full-time reporter at the Arizona Republic, which is the main daily publication in this community. And I had this idea that I was going to start a live storytelling event, kind of like a lot of the ones our colleagues are leading and participating in tonight. Um, but this was in 2011, and Phoenix didn't really have a ton of that going on yet. The moth wasn't even carried on the radio station here yet. That's how like early days we were. But I had given a particularly affecting toast at my twin sister's wedding. And this gave me the sense of like heady possibility that maybe uh, we could like do a storytelling event in my community. There's a lot of backstory there, but just say like gave a good toast at a wedding, thought I should get up in front of a bunch of strangers and do this all the time and tell stories. And my bosses supported this idea and they connected me with anthropologists and educators at South Mountain Community College at the bottom of our city where Liz and her colleague Marilyn had been teaching storytelling for forever. Liz had actually founded the entire institute at the time, um, almost like uh, more, more than 15 years in the past at the time. Now it's more than 25 years old. And the paper set us up. It was going to be like a date. And I remember the first meeting I had with Marilyn. And Marilyn blew my mind because she was like, okay, you're going to be the MC of these shows. You're going to have to talk about yourself at every show. And I was like, I have been waiting for this moment my entire life because I'm love attention. But then Marilyn was like, you're also going to have to ensure the entire room is emotionally safe at all times. And journalism is not really engaged in that conversation. Like we're about the First Amendment and we're about comforting the afflicting the comfortable and comforting the afflicted, but we're not like, hey, are you all right all the time? And so I knew I had a lot to learn from Marilyn and Liz. And I thought, okay, I know how to like run an event, book a room, get microphone and speakers. And the newsroom, of course, can run a story and we can run ads. And like Liz and Marilyn will help out with the coaching. I thought it would take a couple months. They'd like help me figure out how to like make people good at telling stories. And then we'd all move on with their lives. Like it was very transactional, very like collaborative work relationship. And in the beginning, it felt that way a little bit. But after the first few meetings, when I would meet with the ladies, I was really formal. I would bring like a list of explicit questions to ask, like, what do you do if a person wants to talk about trauma? Spoiler alert, help them and figure out if they're ready to talk about it. What do you do if a person just wants to say a bunch of bad things about their mom because they're not totally resolved to their childhood? Keep them from doing that. It's not nice and it makes everyone uncomfortable. So that's a coaching skill you have to learn. Um, I also asked Liz questions like, you know, what do you do to make stories funnier? Well, highlight the difference between their expectations at the time and then what actually happened. Or of course, always it's funny to laugh at who you were then and who you are now. There's like a lot of opportunity of comedy there. But I came in with just like really explicit strategic questions about how to coach and like, how would I write this down and on and on and on. Well, what I thought would take a couple months that went on for years because the project took off in Phoenix. Like it ended up growing. What started out with 60 people at a pizza place in Tempe ended up being like a couple hundred people at a big performing space in Scottsdale. And the more the project grew, the more I needed Liz's help and mentorship. And over the years, every time I picked up the phone or every time I've called her, Liz picked up the phone. Every time I had a question, Liz extended herself to me and she was like, I will try to come up with an answer for that question. And if she didn't know the answer, she would literally be endlessly patient and she would just like let me talk at her until I said the answer, until like I heard the answer in our endless conversations. So when I became pregnant two years ago, I said to my husband, hey, what if we name our son after Liz? Um, we did find out his gender before he was born, and I thought Liz, who didn't have her own children, had certainly secured a legacy for herself in our community, but I thought, I really want her to know how much she means to me, and this is like the greatest way I could show her the impact she made on, my, on our lives. So when he came into the world, Liz was in the room, she sat with my mom and my mother-in-law, who were lovely women, and she kind of became the third grandmother, and it was so great, and we named him George Elias Finnerty Maloof. Elias for Elizabeth. And I thought, okay, this is great. 
I have paid back the wild and extravagant professional generosity of a woman who has changed my life over the last 10 years. Now we're big, we're in like a bunch of cities across Gannett. There's hundreds, of, there's thousands of people who've told stories over the years with our storytelling shows based in newsrooms across America. Like it, it all happened. All of these things I had in mind when I first met Liz, they happened. And I thought, okay, well, kind of even Steven. And then the pandemic happened and my husband and I sat together on that very first few days, like that first, the 11th of March, I think, we looked at each other and said, okay, we have some friends who are like independent people. They don't, they don't, not connected to big institutions. They um, are freelance types and we should look out for them to make sure that they like have money and, and we can like, I don't know, just look out for them and be nice to them and like physically help them if they need money or resources. But then I thought, oh, we got to look in on Liz and Mark. They, um, they live in a big, nice house, like, but by themselves. And I thought like, oh, we'll just, George and I, my baby at the time, five months, we'll like go visit them from time to time. March is a beautiful time of year to sit outside in Phoenix. And so every week I would bundle up, I would bundle George down to South Phoenix. And my husband would have his like tiny period of alone time when he like had a second away from us because we were all in the house all the time, kind of like Margot. And George and I would drive 30 minutes to the bottom half of the city and we would sit out on Mark and Liz's patio. Uh, if you can hear them, that's George in the background. He's two now, he lived. Um, and I thought that I was like giving Liz and Mark the gift of our time of seeing an adorable baby learn to walk over all the months and stuff like that. But I realized over the few months or you know, visit after visit after visit, Liz and Mark were giving me the gift of somewhere to go that wasn't like in my husband's hair. They were giving me the gift of someone to talk to who would listen to me be uncertain. They were giving me the gift of seeing my child through their eyes, somebody who wasn't me and wasn't exhausted and wasn't stressed out and wasn't burnt out, who would just delight in the fact that he had like learned to sit up, learned to start calling, learned to avoid the cactuses because we did let him touch him. And slowly over 18 months, George and I did not miss a weekend. We showed up every time. And what I thought was always me, like kind of trying to like show up for Lizzie Mark, I realized pretty quickly it was them showing up for me. And now we're kind of, we're not really out of the pandemic, I don't think, but we've moved into a different state of all of our lives. And what I wonder to myself now is just that like, maybe Liz is going to keep on giving me gifts that I fundamentally can't pay back. And that's a nice thing to think about. Thank you so much, Megan, and thank you from our audience. Again, everybody, we're all virtual, but go ahead and give a round of applause. I feel that they can feel it uh, on a cosmic level. We really do appreciate that. So that was another fantastic teller. You've now heard three storytellers. We're planning on having a total of six. And again, you will have the opportunity to vote for your favorite teller at the end of tonight's programming. So please do keep their names in mind. Once again, you just heard from Megan Finnerty. And as we are eager to get to some additional tellers, I'm gonna go ahead and pull another one out of the magic picture of telling. Our next storyteller will be Rosana Maria Salcedo. Fantastic a little bit about uh, Rosana. She's a first generation Dominican American artist, educator, entrepreneur, and writer. She was raised in New York City and has spent most of her adult life living and teaching in Massachusetts and New Hampshire. And she's currently working on an interracial, intergenerational memoir about her, her grandmother, and her mother. Please give it up for Rosana Salcedo. Thank you, Wes. In 2007, I got divorced after 10 years of marriage. I was 35 years old and we had two boys together, ages four and 10. The boys remained with me and I continued to be their primary caregiver. On the weekends, my ex-husband would pick them up on Friday evenings and keep them until Sunday afternoon. I know what you're thinking. That's awesome, you had your weekends to yourself, but that's not how it felt at all. Up until that point, my life had been defined by three things. I worked, I was a mom, and I was a wife. My weekends were dictated by those responsibilities, and I enjoyed it. The first weekend my ex came to pick up the boys, I was a mess. First, I had to physically separate from them, and then I found myself utterly alone. How am I going to manage these weekends? How am I going to fill up this time? I need something to take care of. I decided it was time for a dog and I gave myself a puppy. 
but not before doing extensive research. I studied all of the breeds and learned about their respective qualities. I had some aesthetic preferences. Um, I like to be outdoors, so I wanted a dog that would be active with me. And I definitely wanted a female dog because I was tired of being outnumbered. But most of all, I wanted a dog known for its devotion and loyalty and protectiveness. I landed on an English Shepherd, close in breed to the Border Collie and the Australian Shepherd. The breeder was in Missouri, an elderly woman who lived on a farm. She insisted on several phone calls and asked lots of questions. How big is your home? Do you have access to outdoor space? Will the dog be able to get daily exercise? Who do you live with? Do you have children? Why do you want a dog? She explained that she was committed to making sure that all of her puppies were well matched and got loving homes. I appreciated her scrutiny. I also wanted it to be a good match. The puppy is sable, white, and tan with beautiful markings. Her puppy fur is a whisper of the magnificent fur she will have by the time she's a year old. I name her Zoe after no one in particular because I'm told that a good dog name has two syllables and ends in a vowel. She's as sweet as can be and loves to cuddle. When she gets home and settles in, I understand right away that this dog is going to need a lot of training. She loves to play with the boys and wants to dominate them. She mounts them and nips at their ankles. She is a shepherd after all. She's bossy. And I realize there are now two alpha females in the home. We go through many, many rounds of puppy training and finally get to the place where she does obey my commands, but always with a little attitude. There's no doubt that I am her human. She sleeps at the foot of my bed or outside my bedroom door, and she's never more than a few feet away. When she's full grown, she's about 50 pounds, and I get a bigger car with a cargo area. Zoe comes with us everywhere. Hiking, camping, holiday weekends. If I'm ever away for more than a few days, I will drive the boys and Zoe to my parents' house. She is a gracious and well-behaved house guest and my parents love her like a daughter or a granddaughter. Our daily walks are a ritual. Neither of us likes the rain, but we both weather the cold just fine. Trails and fields are easily accessible and these are happy places for us. Zoe knows that as soon as we get to the trailhead, I will let her off leash. And that as soon as we get into the open field, I will chuck the ball into the air for her 30, 40, 50 times. Once in a while, there will be a flock of birds in the middle of the field, geese or seagulls. And if she's off leash, her instincts kick in and she's off, running circles around the birds, trying to herd them. In those moments, I sit in the grass and just watch her in awe of the grace and speed with which she moves her body. When she is done scaring the birds away, she'll come back to me and sit down beside me without me having to even call her. Boyfriends come and go. If they don't appreciate Zoe, the relationship is short-lived. My own boys grow up and their interests take them elsewhere. Zoe starts to slow down. Three mile walks become two mile walks and two mile walks become one, one mile walks. She no longer can climb the stairs in the house and she can't jump into the cargo area anymore. I have to lift her into and out of the car. I meet a man and I fall in love. He's a dog lover too and spoils Zoe as much as I do. When the pandemic hits, we settle into a routine and Zoe is glad and pleased that now she has two people to spend the day with. We spend most of our time in a little house on Cape Cod with a big backyard surrounded by woods and Zoe is content. Last July when um, things got better and it was safe enough to travel, my partner and I wanted to take a two week vacation, but we were concerned about leaving Zoe behind. 
Fortunately, my oldest son agreed to stay with her while we were away. While I was on vacation, I called him every day to check in on them. And he said she was moving slowly, but she was doing fine. I returned on a Sunday and there she was waiting at the door, tail wagging. It had only been two weeks, but even in that short time, I could see that her health had declined. The next day was Monday and she was quiet. I had to encourage her to go outside. And that evening, she didn't sit by our feet the way she usually does. She chose to lay down by herself in a different room. I thought that was strange. On Tuesday, she didn't get up at all. She was awake, but she couldn't lift her body and she would not eat or drink. At 3 p.m., the vet came by the house to examine her and she said that it was a matter of time. I looked into Zoe's eyes and she told me she was ready. Zoe was put to sleep in my arms at home that afternoon. I read somewhere once that dogs come into our lives to help us, to teach us something, uh, to help us grow, and that when we're ready, they take their leave. Zoe gave me 14 years, and she waited for me to return to say goodbye, and for that, I will be forever grateful. All right, thank you so much. That was Rosanna Salcedo. Uh, keep that name in mind, especially if you enjoyed that story. Again, everybody will have the opportunity to vote for their favorite story of the evening at the end of the show. We have two additional tellers uh, remaining in our program, but first I'm gonna throw it to Jamie once again to give you some valuable information about GBH events, World Channel, and how you can contribute to the projects here. Thank you. Thank you, Wes. You know, whatever the story, whatever the topic, whatever you learned from it, your vital support helps create great programming for the public good for everyone to benefit from. Support more great programming and powerful stories. Pledge to give $10 a month as a GBH sustainer or $120 all at once. And you will receive the Stories from the Stage mug and journal as a thank you gift. Please visit gbh.org slash support events to make a donation. We've made it very easy for you to donate tonight. Just click on that support link you see in the chat tab now. That's one way to give. Or you can also text GBH to 800-204-3811. Again, that's text GBH to 800-204-3811. Or you can scan the QR code behind me to be brought directly to our donation page. Thank you again for spending some time with us tonight during Giving Tuesday of all days. And thanks moreover for your support. I hope you enjoy the rest of tonight's stories. All right, all right, thank you so much. We have two additional tellers for the evening. Uh, as before, we will be picking them at random from a hat. So please join me as we welcome our next teller to the stage. Let's see who we have here. We have Sufyan Zemukov, fantastic. And I'll tell you a little bit about Sufyan. He is an award-winning author and performer. He won the 2020 Emerging Artist Award from the National Storytelling Network. His recent solo show, Flirting Like an American, received critical acclaim at the United Solo Festival. His stories are based on his personal experience as a first-generation immigrant here in America. And he says that they are funnier and more entertaining than you may expect. I'm sure that you're absolutely going to love what he has to share please join us in welcoming Sufyan. well thank you so much for such a fantastic introduction as as wes said i uh, moved to the united states i i came from russia and to be precise from a muslim part of russia called circassia and i like observing differences between tough russians and kind americans for example, Russians never smile, while Americans are known for their beautiful smile. Or when Russians are angry, they shout at you, while Americans are nicely passive aggressive. 
And the only countries that puzzles me is that tough Russians are not allowed to carry guns while kind Americans have the Second Amendment. And I've always wondered why Americans are so passionate about guns. So one day I visited a local gun shop out of curiosity. And as I walked in, I was overwhelmed with the diversity of weaponry, including air rifles, semi-automatics, BB guns. And the shop owner with an impressive mustache looked like he walked straight out of a Western movie. He was wearing cowboy boots, huge belt buckle, massive gun on his hip, and a tiny chihuahua under his arm. I made eye contact with the chihuahua and suddenly could hear how the dog was thinking. Well, Dorothy, I guess you're not in Circassia anymore. Uh, so I thought I've had enough of cultural shock for the day and I was about to leave when I saw something in the gun shop that I could not resist buying. It was a turkey collar. It was a whistle that hunters used to trick turkeys to fly into open. And I instantly knew that I desperately needed it. So I said, uh, I'll have the turkey collar. And the shop owner said, uh, that's a crow whistle. The turkey on the label is just a brand picture. And he asked, are you hunting turkeys? No, I said, but I was born thanks to turkeys. I said, I'm from Muslim part of Russia called Circassia, where we have all sorts of strange customs. Circassians marry young and younger siblings can't marry before older ones and parents and children barely talk to each other out of respect. So when my father turned 30 years old and was still unmarried, he created a crisis in the family. On the one hand, he was inadvertently holding his two younger brothers impatiently waiting for their turn to marry. And on the other hand, grandpa couldn't remind him to marry because that was not the kind of conversation that father and son could have. However, my grandpa was renowned for his practical jokes. And this time he used his talent to resolve the crisis in the family. So when he heard that his son started dating my future mother, grandpa decided to expedite their relationship. And he did it in quite innovative way. So grandpa bought two dozen turkeys, released them in the house yard, and made a public announcement. I have bought these turkeys for my older son's wedding party. So since then, every time grandpa would see my father in the, in the yard, grandpa would shout loudly at the turkeys. I regret that I bought you, you useless birds. Now turkeys are known for their intolerance to noise. And every time grandpa shouted at them, two dozen turkeys shouted back at grandpa, gobble, gobble, gobble. Only, of course, they were Circassian turkeys and they gobbled in my native Circassian language, which is kuni kuni kwah kwah. And the whole village was reminded about this 30 years old unmarried dude who was holding up his brothers to marry. So dad proposed to my mom pretty soon after that. And I'm not sure if they married under the pressure of goblin, but I want to believe that two dozen turkeys contributed to my parents' marriage. And I want to believe that I was born thanks to turkeys. So when I was told this story to the shop owner, I noticed that his mustache twitched a little bit. And he said, now I want to find you a turkey collar so much so he and Chihuahua disappeared in the back room and started making cacophony of noises, including boxes falling, loud cursing and Chihuahua barking. Finally, the shop owner re-emerged and said, sorry, I couldn't find the turkey collar, but here is what I can do for you. If you give me your card, I'll let you know as soon as I find it. So several weeks later, I received a package 
with a turkey collar and a card from the shop owner saying, thank you so much for your culture and the story of your birth, uh, like sharing them with me. And please accept this small gift as a welcome to America. So I was glad that my exotic Circassian story resonated with Americans, but more importantly, what the man did actually changed me because I'll confess, I always suspected that people who sell guns would imagine doing it partly to protect America from Muslims. And the last thing I expected coming to the United States was that a shop owner, a gun shop owner would send a welcome to America gift to a Muslim like me. And I was deeply touched by the gesture. What I didn't tell the gun shop owner, however, was the real reason why I wanted the turkey collar. Because when moving to the United States, I hoped to find my better half here. And I know this will sound ridiculous, but like my god grandfather, I wanted to use the turkey goblin to announce to the universe that I was ready to find my significant other. And like turkeys work to get my dad to marry my mom, maybe I could find a wife after announcing my intention through a turkey collar. So as soon as the turkey collar arrived, I took it to the local park just to see if it can attract a woman. And I whistled into the collar and would you know it instantly, a fit brunette jogger stopped next to me. I'm kidding, nobody stopped. Actually, there was a brunette jogger, but she started running faster in the opposite direction. Clearly, I couldn't uh, count on the turkey collar. After all, I needed to attract a woman, not a turkey. And eventually, I did attract a, a beautiful brunette in my life, but that's a different story. All right, thank you so much, Sufyan, for that wonderful story. I hope everyone is enjoying the evening as much as I am. Again, you're hearing the uh, stories from the stage, Story Slam, on the theme of giving. Today is Giving Tuesday. You've heard from our team about how you can help give to this project that we all hold so dear to our hearts. Please do uh, check out World Channel and Stories from the Stage. Also, you can check us out uh, live or rather on television on Fridays at 8 p.m. at GBH2 and on World Channel Mondays at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Time. And with that, we have our final teller of the evening. It's not so much of a mystery as they are the last person in the magical picture of telling, but I am very pleased to announce our final teller. That would be Mr. Mark Lamb. Mark Lamb is originally from the small town of Sturgis, Kentucky. He recently moved back to Kentucky uh, in order to take care of his mother after being the artistic director of Mark Lamb Dance in New York City, where I happen to be right now. He was also featured last from the past. If you've been with us from the beginning, you will have seen him on season one episode one of Stories from the Stage. Very thrilled to have him back again. Please join me in welcoming Mark Lamb. Thank you, Wes. When I left home, my mama gave me an iron skillet that was seasoned years before I was born. Now, if you don't know what it means to season a skillet, basically every time you cook in it, the iron absorbs the oils from the food like a memory and kind of creates this natural Teflon. Well, where I'm from, we like our skillets good and greasy. Now that skillet, it went with me across many state lines, different homes, different kitchens. And then somehow, and I hate to admit this, I misplaced it. Well, as a young performer, I moved around a lot, but I am almost positive though that I misplaced it amidst the pieces of a shattered heart. See, when the love of my life broke my heart, I looked around at all the things we had accrued together. All this stuff that had been seasoned with mutual memories. And y'all, I didn't feel like dealing with the leftovers. So I said, you know what? You can just keep 
everything. I mean it, hon. Now, years later, when I asked my mother for my grandmother's cornbread recipe, she gladly gave it to me and she said, now you make sure you cook it in that iron skillet. Oh Lord, my face felt like something on low boil and it just bubbled up and I blurted out, it's gone. Well, she looked me dead in the eye and said, you know, it took years to season that skillet. It was time for me to go. I was about to walk out the front door of the old home place and make a long drive from West Kentucky back to East Tennessee, where I was living at the time. And as I cut through those rolling Kentucky hills and Nashville traffic and onto the plateau and the peaks and valleys of those great smoky mountains on that five hour drive in the back of my head, I could hear her voice saying over and over, you know, it took years to season that skillet. It took years to season that skillet. It took years to season that skillet. It took years. So when I got back to Knoxville, I did what I know best to do when I need to heal and make things right. I make art. See, I'm a choreographer. And I asked about a dozen different dancers to go out and interview family members on what an iron skillet meant in the history of their families. And those stories, Oh, they bubbled up like cornbread batter hitting hot bacon grease. You could just smell the memories. There was Karen, who talked about four generations of women standing around this large iron skillet filled with a pone of cornbread. And they're pulling apart that cornbread for their Thanksgiving dressing. And then they pop a piece in their mouth. And she said that it felt like communion because her family believes in Greece. And I don't mean the country, I mean the pork fat. And then there was Julie. She was from a well-to-do family and she had lost her beloved grandmother. Her grandmother in the will left Julie a beautiful blue diamond engagement ring and no one in her family batted an eye. But when Julie asked for that iron skillet, all hell broke loose. Well, we put all these different stories into a dance theater piece that I call Into the Fire. And afterwards, I could not wait to see my mother's reaction. I had dedicated the piece to her and I ran up to her. I grabbed her by the shoulders and said, Mom, what'd you think? And she said, Mark, honey, the singing was real nice. Now, a couple of years later, I found myself in the parking lot of this wine shop and this beautiful blonde woman approaches me. She reminded me of a bowl full of cherries that had been marinating in just a little bit too much red wine. And she says, you're Mark Lamb. And I said, yes. And she said, I want you to know I loved your piece Into the Fire. And I said, why, thank you. And she said, a couple of weeks before I saw that piece, my favorite aunt had passed away and I was having a real hard time. And she gets choked up and then she grabs me real hard by the wrist and she pulls me over to the back of this car and she pops open the trunk and she reaches down inside and she lifts out this iron skillet and she places it in my hands with reverence. She says, this was my aunt's iron skillet. I'm a family therapist. And whenever we start group therapy, we pass around the skillet and people tell their skillet stories. And I think it helps them to start the healing process. And I thought to myself, I am so glad that she did not push me in that trunk. And then I thought, well, by God, maybe I've done my job. See, 
I know I will probably never feed someone by fixing them a meal in that iron skillet ever again. But I think maybe in losing that skillet, I help to feed folks in a different way. To remind them how it takes years and years to season those mutual memories. And like me, remind them of where they come from and who they are. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Fantastic way to end our evening. You just heard six fantastic storytellers on the theme of giving. This is Stories from the Stage, our Giving Tuesday edition. We will now have the opportunity for you to vote for your favorite teller of the evening. Again, this is a story slam. So right up on Zoom, you should be seeing shortly a poll. Uh, please just go ahead and make your selection. You only have to pick uh, one individual and uh, go ahead and submit that. As those are getting, getting tabulated, we did want to remind everyone to please visit gbh.org slash supporting events. That way you can contribute to our fantastic cause, as has been said here before, storytelling is at the heart of what we do here at GBH and World Channel. So please do support the show and allow us to bring future programming like this and our wonderful show, which is entering its fifth season. Again, you can check out Stories from the Stage on television, GBH2, Fridays at 8 p.m. and Mondays at 9.30 p.m. Eastern on World Channel. Also uh, online, check out worldchannel.org. You can see all episodes of the show there. Uh, it has been quite a journey these last few years, uh, me along with my co-host, Teresa Kogan, and the entire amazing uh, team behind Stories from the Stage. We really do enjoy the opportunity to bring these amazing tellers to you. So uh, let's take a look again. You uh, saw Shandra Leary, Margot Leitman, Mark Lamb, Megan Finnerty, Rosanna Salcedo, and Sufjan Zamuka. Uh, we have people submitting their votes right now. So I'm gonna rely on the team to let me know in the chat when we have a, uh, when I'm not seeing results on my side, I'm not sure if I'm going to be seeing that. So let's take a look. All right, fantastic. And we have our winner again. Thank you everyone for watching. Our lucky winner, winner of the $125 cash prize is Sufjan, Sufjan Zamukov. So please uh, round of applause again. They won't be able to hear it, but in spirit, we know it's there. Make some noise. Congratulations to Sufjan. Again, this is World Channel. This is GBH, Stories from the Stage, Giving Tuesday. I've been your host, Wes Hazard. Thank you so much for joining us. It has been a fantastic evening and check out gbh.org in order to find out more info about how you can support our wonderful mission. Thank you.